for the BBC Home Service. Against the wind. As tonight's play in this series, Saturday Night Theatre presents Howard Marion Crawford in Carrington, V.C. by Dorothy and Campbell Christie. Good morning, Sergeant. Is this the scene of the great trial? No, through that door. That's the court-martial room. What do we do, Sergeant? Just walk in? No one just walks in here. May I know your business, gentlemen? A court-martial is an open court. You can't keep me out. Can't I? You aren't allowed in barracks except on business. Just tell me how you make the court without getting into barracks and we'll start again. I don't mind him, Sergeant. He just likes arguing. He's Evans of the Echo. I'm cooked from the Mercury. And the court's not open yet. Oh, I see. The uh, Echo doesn't often waste its space on the army, does it? The army isn't news in peacetime. Not till a B.C. puts his hand in the till. Try printing that and see what you get. What's the girl like? What girl? The girl they found in Carrington's room. Are we going to see her? Yes, you'll see her. Is she worth seeing? What's the judge's name? The president of the court is Brigadier Meadmore, assisted by a civilian gentleman from the judge advocate's branch. I don't know much about these things. Is there a jury? The court also consists of four officers from other regiments. Oh, here today to... Oh, court's open. Oh, come along, please, if you're coming. Take your hats off and put out those cigarettes. Major Carrington, please. Court's open, sir. Are you guilty or not guilty of the third charge against you which you've heard read? Not guilty, sir. Uh, Major Carrington, may I again remind you that you may be putting yourself at a disadvantage by not engaging counsel? Well, sir, I don't think I need a barrister. I'm just going to tell the court the truth. Well... No advocate would object to doing that, Major Carrington. And he might help to present your case in its most favourable light. I know, sir, but I'd sooner have it as it is. Very well. Does the prosecutor propose to make an opening address? Yes, sir. May it please the court. Up to April the 8th of this year, the accused was in command of the 24th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery. You will hear the evidence of the pay sergeant of the battery that on April the 6th, the sum of £140 odd was drawn from the bank for payment of a draft due to leave for abroad on that afternoon. Later that morning, the departure of the draft was postponed. The money was not paid out, and it remained, or should have remained, in the battery safe. On the morning of April the 8th, the pay sergeant had occasion to check the cash in this battery safe, and he found it to be short by £125. You will hear the evidence of an official of Lloyd's Bank, Crayshot, that on the morning of April the 7th, the accused, whose bank account was overdrawn, paid in in person £100 in £1 notes, and at the same time transferred to the account of his wife in a London bank the same sum of £100. <coughs> you will hear the evidence of a brother officer of the accused, who on the same morning of April the 7th was given by the accused £25, again in £1 notes, and asked to invest this sum at the best price he could get on a horse called Peter Pan. Now, this horse was running that afternoon in the Royal Artillery Gold Cup at Sandown Park, and it was ridden, successfully as it turned out, by the accused. There is, as so often where fraud is alleged, no direct evidence. No one saw the accused take the money from the safe, but it will, I think, be quite clear to you when you've heard the evidence that these 125 one-pound notes in the possession of the accused on the morning of April the 7th were the same notes which had been lodged in the battery safe the previous day. In the second charge, that of absence without leave, you will hear the evidence of the accused commanding officer, Colonel Henniker, who expressly refused Major Carrington leave of absence to ride in the Royal Artillery meeting. You will hear of a heated interview in which the accused announced his intention of absenting himself to ride whether he had leave or not. And you will hear that he did so absent himself. Touching the third charge, Colonel Henniker had issued a regimental order that officers were not to entertain officers of the Women's Royal Army Corps in their single quarters in barracks. Evidence will show that the accused disregarded this order. Now, gentlemen, 
I conceive it my duty to point out to you that in this case it is for the accused to establish nothing. The burden of proof rests on the prosecution. If, at the close of this case, you are not satisfied that the prosecution has discharged that burden, it will be your pleasure to acquit the accused and let him go free. If, however, you decide that the prosecution has discharged its task, then the terms of your oath will leave you no alternative other than to find the accused guilty of the charge or charges. That is all I propose to say at this stage. With the court's permission, I will now proceed to call evidence. Call Sergeant Owen. You are number 962473 Sergeant Owen of the 24th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery, Royal Artillery. No, sir. I beg your pardon? Bombardier Owen, sir. Uh, Fulton, what's all this? He's down on my list of witnesses as a sergeant, sir. Yes, and you're down on the summary of evidence as a sergeant. Yes, sir. Oh, I see. When this summary was taken, you were a sergeant and now you're a bombardier. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's quite correct. You are pay sergeant, or pay bombardier, of the 24th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery? No, sir. The bombardier Owen, we'll take this in stages. On the 6th of April this year, were you pay sergeant of the 24th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery? Yes, sir. Thank you. On that date... Was the battery commanded by the accused, Major Carrington? Yes, sir. Do you see Major Carrington in court? Yes, sir. On the afternoon of the 6th of April, was a draft from the battery due to leave for overseas? Yes, sir. Did you, as pay sergeant, make out a cheque on that date for £140, 8 shillings and 9 pence on the impressed account for payment of that draft? Yes, sir. Did the accused sign that cheque and was it cashed? Yes, sir. What happened to the money which had been drawn? I put it in the battery safe, sir. Uh, so there was for the moment... More money than usual in the safe? Yes, sir. Who had the key? I did, sir. Mm -hmm. Do you always keep the key of the battery safe? Yes, sir. Is that usual? I couldn't say, sir. Highly unusual and strictly against regulations. Well, sir, the, the Major always said he was more likely to lose the key than I was to pinch the catch. <laughs> <laughs> was the key continuously in your possession from the morning of the 6th of April until, say, noon on the 8th? No. What happened to it? Uh, don't look round at the accused, please. Just answer my question. The Major borrowed it on the morning of the 7th. Did he give it back to you? Oh, yes, sir. Same morning. Now, we pass on to the next day, the 8th of April. Was the accused in the battery office at any time during that day? No, sir. He was in hospital. Having had, I believe, a fall when riding in a race the day before. Yes, sir. Uh, one moment, Major Mansell. Uh, didn't you say in your opening address that the accused won his race at Sandown? He won the Gold Cup, sir but had a fall in the next race. I see, thank you. Bombardier Owen, on that morning, the 8th of April, did Captain Graham of the Women's Royal Army Corps come to the battery office to speak to you? Yes, sir. In consequence of what she said, did you open the office safe and check the money in it? Yes, sir. I won't ask you any more about the money at the moment, but did Captain Graham then leave the office? Yes, sir. And shortly after that, did the adjutant come to the office? Yes, sir. Did he ask you for the key of the safe? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, did the adjutant... One moment, please. I don't know your name. I'm speaking to your escort, Major Carrington. Uh, Forbes, sir. Your part in these proceedings, Major Forbes, is a perfectly silent one. I'm sorry, sir. Continue, Major Manson. Did the adjutant then ask you for the key of the safe? Yes, sir. Did you give it to him? No, sir. Did the adjutant tell you he had Colonel Henniker's authority to open the safe? Yes, but I was responsible to my battery commander, not to the colonel, uh, Yes, sir. well, what happened then? Well, sir, there were some words passed, and I found myself under arrest. And does that explain the missing stripe, Bombardier Owen? That's right, sir. <laughs> Did the adjutant eventually open the safe? Yes, sir. How? With a duplicate key, which in our regiment is kept in the regimental office to fit every battery safe, which is news to me. <laughs> well, be that as it may, the safe was opened. Did the adjutant then in your presence count the money in the safe? Yes, sir. Can you remember how much there was? Twenty-eight pounds, nine and four, sir. Did you then, on the adjutant's orders, produce your books and work out how much cash there should have been in the safe? Yes, sir. Can you remember that figure? One hundred and fifty-three pounds, nine and four. Therefore, you can say, with certainty, that at that time, on the morning of the 8th, there was one hundred and twenty-five pounds missing from the battery safe. Can't you? Yes, sir. Very well, then. 
Now, we pass on to some 30 minutes May later. May I interrupt, sir? Uh, yes, Colonel Reeve. Are we going to hear more about this regimental key for the battery safe? Mr. Terry. Major Mantle, is the court going to hear any more evidence about the key uh, from the prosecution? Oh, certainly, sir. There will be evidence from the adjutant who had charge of it and from the officer in charge of administration. May I say something about that, sir? Certainly, Major Carrington. I can assure the court the key isn't important. I'm not going to deny that this money was missing, and I'm certainly not going to suggest that the adjutant took it. With respect, sir, that is not the point at issue. Whatever the accused may choose to admit, the prosecution must still show that the money was in the safe at one time and then found to be missing. And for that, we need the evidence about the key. I quite agree. We can't rely upon a casual admission by the accused to establish the prosecution's case. We'll take that evidence. If you please, sir. Now, Bombardier, I... One moment, please. Mr. Terry, I have some views on this point. Yes, sir. I'd like to discuss them with you more privately. Uh, the court is closed. Uh, one moment, please. Bombardier Owen. Ah. Uh, please remember that you are giving evidence. During this adjournment, you must not speak to anyone. Very good, sir. I think I must remind you, Mr. Terry, that there is only one president of this court-martial. Certainly, sir. Have I said anything that seems to contradict that? Your decision to hear the evidence about the key was taken without any reference to me. But surely the judge advocate is responsible for guiding the court on purely legal points. Responsible to the president, Mr. Terry. And he takes no decisions. No, sir. But we don't want our finding quashed by superior authority. In 32 years' service, I've presided over a number of courts, Marshal. I seldom had the benefit of a judge advocate's assistance, and I've never had a court quashed yet. I certainly have no wish to usurp your authority, sir. I'm sure you haven't, Mr. Terry. Two queen bees in a hive is never a sound proposition. Now, shall we both glance through the summary and decide whether all this evidence about the key is really necessary? By all means. Uh, may the now, court smoke, please, sir? Please certainly. <clears throat> Pretty casual, Reeve. Trusting your pay sergeant for the key and save? Yes, well, I expect we've all done it on occasion. Depends on the pay sergeant. I was pay sergeant once. No one ever trusted me with a key. Mm. Are we going to see this CO, sir, who keeps keys to fit all the battery safes? Certainly, Major Brooksmith. Ah. Common habit in the gunners? Never heard of it before. Oh, but this chap Hennecker's like that. Commands all the batteries from the regimental office. Ah, I know him, do you? What's he like? Proper swine, in my opinion. Colonel Reeve. <clears throat> sir? That was a most objectionable remark. Yes, I'm sorry it was. Oh, don't misunderstand me. After a witness has appeared before us, you can say what you like about him in closed court. But until we've seen and heard him, any attempt to prejudice the court is most improper. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Terry. But you see, sir, according to... I don't agree Clark. with you anyway, Reeve. I was at the staff college with Henneker. We thought he was quite outstanding. Yes, oh, well, I won't argue. Gentlemen... I hope you'll all try not to allow your personal opinion of a witness to influence your judgment of his evidence. So, even if you've known a man for 20 years, Mr. Terry, you should still assess his evidence only on what you've seen of him in the witness box. Certainly. That's the legal view, Reeve, so I'll refrain from comment. Do I gather you don't agree? Oh, I admit, if I know a witness personally as a fluent and plausible liar, I tend to suspect his evidence. Which means you're judging that evidence on your prior knowledge of his character. You can put it that way, I won't object. But, my dear sir... I want the right answer, Mr. Terry, that's all. Carrington's whole future depends on the decision of this court. Let's take any help we can get. A true verdict, that's all that matters. And now this key... Well, you see, sir, my point is that unless we have the evidence about the key... Well, we didn't get much from the prosecutor's address, Jim, did we? No. You know, Copper, I still think we ought to have plugged this claim of right business. Listen to this. Chapter 6, paragraph 26, subsection... No, Jim, no, no. If we wanted a legal quibble, we'd have had a lawyer. I still think we should have. Yes, you're pig-headed, old sir, so you would. Isn't it time this court reopened? Yeah, I still argue with us about the key, I suppose. As if it matters. <laughs> I must say, it's nice to have you as my escort, Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry you stopped a rocket from old Meadmore. Oh, they bounce off me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to hit it off with the judge advocate, do you? Yeah, suits us. Those two are going to start a private war. They might forget about me. <laughs> come in. Oh, Alison, you can't come in here. I'm in. 
I want to see Copper. You can't. You're on the other side. If they find you in here, they'll shoot the lot of us. I've come to ask Copper what he wants me to say. Oh, well, that's handsome from a prosecution witness. Well, just tell him the truth, Alison. What you said in the summary is quite all right. Well, I hardly said anything in the summary. They wouldn't let me. Well, they won't today. You'll just have to answer questions. There are lots of ways of answering a question. Are you going to ask me any? Well, I, I may. It depends on how much the prosecution lets you say. But if I do, just stick to facts. Don't try to think up helpful answers. My one ambition is to get the whole story out in court, not just the bits that suit the prosecution. So the more I talk, the better. Is that right? On this occasion, yes. <laughs> Perfectly right. We want a bit of help. We are not calling any witnesses. What? What do you mean? Copper, isn't Mallory giving evidence? No. Nope. Why not? What's happened? She can't. She's not up to it. Well, then let's ask for an adjournment till she's well. No. Nope. This isn't anything to do with me, is it? Hmm? She's not taking that charge seriously, the one about improperly entertaining me. No, of course she's not. She knows exactly what happened. I told her. Where is she? Back in the nursing home? No, in London with her people. Have you seen her lately? No, not just lately. Copper, may I go up and talk to her this evening? I might be able to persuade her. Look, I've told her I don't want her. Now, she can only give them facts and figures and tell them about our income and expenses, and I can do that. Copper, it's not a lot to ask. Just to come down tomorrow and tell them herself what hell these last two years have been for her, for both of you. Why is that any better than my telling them she's had a nervous breakdown? Because inside two minutes, if she put her mind to it, she could have that court eating out of her hand. No. They've got to acquit me because they believe I didn't steal this money, not because they've fallen for my wife. Anyway, she's not giving evidence. She's just not up to it. You can't drag a woman into court. Can't you? I'm being dragged. I was ordered to attend. I know, and I'm damn sorry about you, but well, that's the prosecution. They can't order Bell to attend. No, but you can. You know, Alison, this is very nice of you and all that, but do you really think it's quite your business? Well, do you? Yes. Yes, I do. Does that surprise you? You can't expect your friends not to care how this goes. Once this is over, I'll stand down, but just for the moment, and what with one thing and another, I think this is my business. So do I. Sorry, Alison. <laughs> it's all right. You are going to tell them she wrote and asked you for the money. Yes. And what you wanted it for. Of course, to pay a school bill. I'm hoping that'll touch their hearts. You are going to show them a letter. No. But two minutes ago, you were asking me to tell them everything. Not that side of it. But that's... Oh, Copper, that's the side to tell them. You needn't blame her. No one wants you to do that. She got a bill she couldn't pay, and she was desperate. She wrote a desperate letter. Well, let them see it. No. All right, don't. Don't lift a finger. Don't even try. Stand up in court in a nice military attitude and answer their questions in a nice gentlemanly way. And then start looking for a nice civilian job, because that's what you're going to need. Court's opening, sir. Thank you, Crane. Come on, Copper. I mustn't keep them waiting. Well, one thing's certain. They can't start without me. Major Mansell, uh, the judge advocate has convinced me that I mustn't try to conduct your case for you. So we'll hear your evidence about the key. If you please, sir. Uh, please continue with your examination of the witness. Uh, come on, Bombardiero in. Sir. Uh, the adjutant had just opened Bombardiero in safe with his private key. Bombardiero in was under open arrest, and the accused was still in hospital. Bombardiero in. After the money was found to be missing... Did the adjutant leave the office? Yes, sir. And shortly after that, did Captain Graham return, bringing with her some money? Yes, sir. How much? £125, sir. Did she say what that money was for? Beg pardon, sir. Am I supposed to say what Captain Graham said to me, sir? I don't think he should answer that question, Major Mansell. Bombardier Owen evidently remembers that what the girl said to the soldier isn't evidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put it another way. Did Captain Graham give you the money? Well, no, sir. What did she do with the money? Well, nothing, sir, because I told her the balloon had gone up and it was too late. <laughs> Thank you. That is all. Do you want to cross-examine Major Carrington? Yes, please. Now, Owen. Sir? Can you say when I first joined 24 Battery? Yes, sir. June the 10th, 1952, sir. In the course of your duty, did you help me to press my claim for money due from the paymaster? Yes, sir. And can you say what this money... What was the total amount? Major Forbes. Sir, 
Your duties are to restrain Major Carrington from flight and to suppress any attempt at violence on his part. You are not there to assist in his defence or jog his memory. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Sergeant, close that window. We seem to have the choice between being deafened or suffocated. Uh, Go on, Major Carrington. Thank you, sir. Now then, can you quote the total amount which I claimed? Yes, sir. 207 pounds, three shillings and fours. Can you say what the money was due for? Yes, sir. Disturbance allowance for three moves in 11 months. Command pay in Hong Kong for just over five months in 1952. Compensation for loss of kit in HMT Vanessa in August 1950. And seven minor items, sir. And the period covered by these claims? Over two years, sir. Can you say how many letters we wrote between us about all this? Yes, sir. There were 33 proper letters, sir, not counting 14 reminders. 33 were there? I'm afraid you put in a lot of overtime on my private affairs. Well, never mind that, sir. Did the paymaster ever admit any liability for any part of our claim? Yes, sir. One of those letters, dated February the 12th last, admitted our claims for £190, 8 shillings and 4 pence, sir. Did they pay on that debt? No, sir. The letter said they had not yet verified the Part 2 order posting you to Hong Kong in November 52, sir. So they sat on the lot. <laughs> Did we eventually, and almost entirely owing to you, Strike the jackpot, Bombardier your name? We got a part payment, sir. How much? £152, two shillings and tenpence, sir. On what day? The draft came into the battery office on April the 14th, sir. Two months after they admitted liability, and a week after the money was taken out of the battery safe. Now, only one more question. When on April the 8th you and Captain Graham found the money was missing, you did your best to cover up the loss? Yes, sir. Well, that was very friendly of you both, but will you tell the court whether I had asked you to do it? No, sir. You were in hospital. We did it on our own. Thank you. That's all, Owen. Thank you, sir. Do you wish to re-examine Major Mansell? No, thank you, sir. Have you any questions, sir? No, thank you, Mr. Terry. Any questions by the court? Colonel uh, Huxford? No, no. Colonel Reeve? No, sir. Major Panton? Not the man, sir. Major Brooksmith? No, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Bombardier Owen. That is all. Thank you, sir. Call Captain Graham, please. Sir. Sergeant, what is your name? Sergeant Crane, sir. Well, Sergeant Crane, could you please refrain from making quite such a clatter in the course of your duties? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It is quite possible to be smart without stamping. A barbaric habit introduced in quite recent times by Her Majesty's foot guards. Uh, Major Brooksmith, might I trouble you? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Captain Graham. Uh, One small point, Major Mansell. Uh, Do you think your overworked assistant could arrange a supply of drinking water for me too? Oh, certainly, sir. Uh, Fortune, would you mind? What? Oh, yes, sir. Certainly, sir. Captain Graham. Take the book in your right hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. The evidence which I shall give before this court. That the evidence which I shall give before this court. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. (laughs) You are Captain A.L. Graham of the Women's Royal Army Corps? Yes, sir. You're serving in the 47th Heavy Anti-Aircraft Battery? Yes, sir. You are a friend of the accused? Yes, sir. On the morning of the 8th of April last, where was the accused? In hospital. Did you that morning telephone to Mrs. Carrington, who was in London? Yes, sir. As a result of that... One moment, please. Sergeant Crane. Sir. Steady the glass with your left hand. Yes, sir. Thank you. As a result of that As a result of that telephone conversation, what did you do? I went to Major Carrington's battery office uh, One moment, I... please. This telephone conversation, Major Mansell, is that all we can hear? Uh, what this witness said, sir, is of no importance. And we can't, of course, get from her what Mrs. Carrington said? No, sir, certainly not. But we may hear more later. Uh, that is not for the prosecution to say, sir. I'm not calling my wife, sir. She's not fit to give evidence. She's been ill. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you, sir. Go on, please, Major Mansell. Captain Graham, after speaking to Mrs. Carrington on the telephone, what did you do? I went to 24 Battery's office and asked the pay sergeant to check the cash in the safe. Did he do so? Yes, sir. There was £125 missing. What did you do then? 
I went away and got a hundred and twenty-five pounds and took it back to twenty-four batteries. Oh, oh please! And you went away and got a hundred and twenty-five pounds. Where from? From my battery commander, Major Holt. I knew he was holding some money for Major Carrington. I see. So you took this money? I took it back to twenty-four batteries' office, meaning to put it in the safe. But I was too late. The cash had already been missed. Now, Captain Graham. Later that same day, the accused came out of hospital and returned to the mess. Did you see him on his return? Not immediately. I didn't hear until after dinner that he was back. When did you see him? At about ten o'clock that night. Where did you see him? In his quarters. You know of the regimental order against officers entertaining officers of the Women's Royal Army Corps in single quarters? He wasn't entertaining me. He was ill. He didn't ask me to go and see him. I went. I had to talk to him. Did he ask you to leave? Yes. He begged me to go away. But he made no effort to compel you to leave the room. Compel me? He was ill, just out of hospital. He didn't shout for help, if that's what you mean. <laughs> uh, Captain Graham, uh, you say you wanted to... One moment, please. Uh, what is it, Colonel Reeve? It's Mrs. Carrington, sir. Oh, Carrington. oh, I see. Uh, uh, Major Carrington, huh? you told me just now that you were not asking your wife to give evidence because she was ill. Yes, sir. I got the impression that but for that you would have called her. Yes, sir. Is that your wife who has just come into court? I... Yes, sir. But if you mean to call her as a witness, she shouldn't be in court. My husband doesn't mean to call me as a witness. Can I take that as quite certain, Major Carrington? Well, sir, I... If there's any doubt, why not discuss it with your wife in the luncheon interval? Thank you, sir. Then, Mrs. Carrington, I must ask you to withdraw. Sergeant Crane. Sir? Show Mrs. Carrington where she can wait. Very good, sir. Go on, please, Major Mansell. Captain Graham, you say you went to the accused's room to talk to him. What did you want to say? I wanted to tell him what I'd done about the money. And I wanted to tell him that Colonel Henniker was out to get him at any price. Captain Graham. I'm sorry, sir. The prosecutor asked me what I said to Major Carrington. Did the accused say anything to you about the missing money? Yes. He said he'd taken it. Did he tell you what he'd done with it? Yes, he said he'd sent a hundred pounds to his wife and given the rest to Major Holt to put on the horse he was riding in the gold cup. And this horse won. Hence the mysterious fund which Major Holt was holding. Yes, sir. How long were you in the accused quarter that night? About an hour, I think, till Colonel Henniker came in. What happened then? Colonel Henniker was very rude to me, sir. He said some quite outrageous things. I think you must regard that as one of the risks of your profession, Captain Graham. <laughs> Just tell the court what happened. I can't, sir. He and Major Carrington started an argument and I left the room. As a matter of fact, I was sent out of the room. Thank you, Captain Graham. That is all. Major Carrington, are you cross-examining? Yes, please. Captain Graham... On April the 8th, when you found I'd taken £125 from my battery safe, you went to a lot of trouble to try to put it back. Yes. Please don't think I'm not grateful. But uh, had I asked you to do that? No, you hadn't. You were in hospital and you didn't know anything of what I was doing. Thank you. Now, you say that I had told you that night I'd taken this money. Yes. Had you ever heard me say before then that I might do that? Yes, but I hadn't believed you. Please, will you tell the court about that conversation? It was on the day before. In the morning, about ten o'clock. I met you coming out of Colonel Henniker's office. You said you'd had another row with him about the money the government owed you. Go on. Well, you said he wasn't doing a thing to back up your claim and you were sick of waiting. You said you'd told him that and you'd told him you were going to take the money out of the battery safe. Thank you, Captain Graham. That's all. Uh, Major Mansell? No, thank you, sir. Any questions, sir? No, thank you, Mr. Terry. Any questions by the court? No, no. Uh, Captain Graham, thank you, that is all. Will you take Major Holt now, sir? Oh, I think we might, uh, if that suits you, sir. Uh, just as you like, Mr. Terry. We could take Major Holt, or uh, what's the time? Uh, we could take luncheon. As you please, sir. Luncheon, I think. Adjourning until 2.15. The court is adjourned. <laughs> I was trying to organize something about my dog. There you are, Val, so I wasn't dreaming. Hello, Copper. Hello, Jim. How are you, Val? Oh, I didn't know you were on your feet again. Darling, you've not been keeping in touch. I crawled out of bed the day before yesterday. How are you? 
Where are the handcuffs? Oh, they trust Jim to look after me. How's it going? Did Alison do her stuff? Yes, she was pretty good. I'm sorry they wouldn't let you stay and see the show. You oughtn't to have come down here at all. Father said it would look better, and I thought you might like to see me. Well, uh, now you are here, how, how do you feel about giving evidence? You said you didn't want me to. Well, I didn't think you were fit. I'm not. If you like, I'll produce a doctor's certificate. What evidence? What about? Well, nothing difficult, nothing you'd mind. Just the facts of life in the army, the cost of living, the famous gap between what they paid us and what we were forced to spend. Good heavens, just give them the figures. Tell them what six months in a furnished flat in Singapore did to our war savings. Well, that a year in an hotel in Hong Kong with two children cost you exactly twice what they pay you. Point out that five moves in three years would break anyone. And tell them the whole thing's half killed me. That's the stuff. That's all we want you to say. Why can't Copper say it? Well, I can, but I don't look right. I don't look as if anything had half killed me. I can't. I know it's futile of me, but I can't. I'm sorry. Val, it wouldn't take ten minutes. It wouldn't take five. You've seen the court. Leave it, Jim. Look, Val, let me explain. Leave it. All right. Well, I expect you can do without me. I'll go. Thanks. Five minutes, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, just a second, Jim. Yeah? Uh, where are you lunching, Val? Oh. Shall Jim get on to the Holtz and, and ask if they'll have him? Yes, please. Ring Nora, will you please, Jim? Give her my love and say I'll be over in ten minutes. Right. And honestly, Jim, you can't think less of me than I do. I think the whole thing's damned hard on you. So do I. Most people would take it. Why can't I? I would give evidence if I could. Of course I would. But, but when the moment came, I'd just run out on you. Outside that courtroom this morning, I stood there for ten minutes like a stuck pig before I could screw myself up to open the door and walk in. I wish I'd seen you. I've never seen you look like a stuck pig. Copper, what's wrong with me? You're not well. That's what's wrong. How are the boys? They're all right. It's very unfair, isn't it? They shouldn't be made responsible for a stepfather. They've always been so terribly proud of you. Well, I promised I'd keep you out of this as far as I possibly could, but you realise I'll have to tell the court why I took the money? What do you mean? I'll have to mention your letter. You mean you're going to try to put the blame on me? No, no, not for a minute. Will the court be interested in my letter? Father says it doesn't make the slightest difference why you took the money. I haven't confided my line of defence to your father. My whole case is that the Treasury owed us money which it wouldn't pay. In the end, and through no fault of our own, we got to a point where we couldn't wait any longer. I had to have a hundred pounds, and I had to have it that day. Well, can't you just say you were being pressed for payment of the boys' school bills? Pressed so hard by the school that I had to have the money that same day. So you are going to say it was my letter that made you do it? Well, I'm not, as a matter of fact, but would it be so unfair if I did? You know it would. I was frantic. I hardly knew what I was writing. I'd never kill myself. How could I? How could I leave the boys? You should have known that. Should I? Well, somehow I didn't feel inclined to risk it. Please don't bring up that letter. It was private. It's unforgivable to broadcast it. Have you still got it? Yes. Please, tear it up. If that letter got dragged out in court and published in the papers, I, I think I'd die. Copper, I was frantic. I, I'd had about as much as I could stand. Well, I wasn't having much fun either. And that letter didn't help. Never mind. All I said was, I'm going to have to tell the court that you wrote asking me for the money by return. I can't stand I... it. I cannot stand having our private affairs dragged out in court for everyone to hear. Well, I didn't do anything I'm ashamed of, and I've got quite a case, you know. Well, what's going to happen? Tell me honestly. I'm going to get off. Well, I took the money openly. I told Henniker I'd take it, and I took it. Whatever that was, it wasn't fraudulent. No, it was crazy. You knew he'd have you court-martialed if you took it. He said so. Suppose you do get off. What do we do? Well, isn't there only one thing to do? Don't we pick ourselves up and start again? In the army? Yes, of course. Why, of course. Copper, we can't. Let's face it, we can't live. We've tried it always. Tell me one more thing we can give up or go without. Oh, yes, I know. The boys. A cheaper school. Well, that I won't do. Anything else you like, not that. Well, once we're out of debt... No, we still couldn't do it. We'd still be ten pounds short every month of what we've got to have if we're to live as we're expected to live and educate the boys. You mean, leave the army? Yes. Well, where will you ever get to after this? Will you ever be promoted? Yes. Yes, of course I shall. If I'm acquitted, and I shall be, this won't hurt me. Won't it? Won't you always be the man who pinched the cash and got away with it? Oh, yes, and wasn't there something about another woman? Oh, no one's taking that third charge seriously, not even the prosecution. Lucky for you, I'm not, isn't it? My one solitary virtue. I'm not jealous. Not all that virtuous. You've never had cause to be jealous. Copper, let's chuck the army. 
It's the only thing I can do, the only job I'm trained for. And, incidentally, it's the only thing I want to do. Oh, well. Do you want me to stay down here this afternoon? No, that's all right. Then I'll get back to London after lunch. When will this finish? Should finish tomorrow. I'll ring you when we get the answer. Yes, please. You still haven't told me what we do when this is over. Go on as we are, I suppose. Well, living apart, you mean? Till we've straightened things out. Till we're out of debt. Well, what else can we do? Well, we could start again together, couldn't we? Straighten things out together? Oh, Val, I know how hard it's been for you, but I've had, well, five months without you and three weeks under arrest with this hanging over me. And then a week ago, I, I wrote to you and told you I loved you and I tried to tell you how much. I dragged out everything I felt about us and put it down on paper. And you didn't even answer. I couldn't. I tried. It's no use making promises you know you won't be able to keep. Copper, I don't think we've had a chance. These last two years, they've taken everything. They've been fatal. Even the past's gone, the time when we were happy. It seems to me we've always been in trouble. We've always been apart. We've never been in love. Oh, that isn't true. You know it isn't. Val, Nora's come to fetch you. She's got the car. I'm ready, Jim. Goodbye, Copper. Good luck. Val, we can't leave things like that. Let's wait and see. Perhaps when this is over... Oh, let's leave it, Copper. Come on, my overworked assistant. Sir. Can't you find it? Just a minute. Ah, here we are. No, hell, that's not it. I only gave it to you just before lunch. Oh, I know you did, sir, and I filed it at once. That usually means we never see it again. Oh, rot, I never lose our papers. It's just I can't always put my hand on the right one at the right mo Here we are. Oh, and good, here are those notes you dictated last night. Oh. I knew I had them somewhere. <laughs> Hope you can read them. Luckily, I've got an excellent memory. Now, are you sure you've got all the witnesses laid on? Yes, sir. I've got Major Holt and the adjutant standing by now, and I detailed the bank manager for a quarter to three. Come in. Will uh, this do for your dog, sir? Oh, by Jove. Thanks awfully, Sergeant. He's chewed through his rope again, sir. Damn. I knew it. I heard him stop howling. He's round by the cookhouse, sir. Uh, that way. <laughs> I don't if he'll have much appetite by now. Oh, you'd be surprised. He can always fit in a bit more. <laughs> Thanks very much. You're welcome, sir. Do you know what they gave him at Chelsea Barracks last week? Ration biscuits soaked in hot water. Quite a show for the cold stream, I thought. Is that why he bit the court orderly? I dare say. He's getting pretty intelligent. I now, haven't seen him... forget that brute for the moment. The witnesses. Next to are hanging round anywhere, and I told Colonel Henniker to report here after lunch and find out when you'll want him. Queer blank. Oh? Elucidate, Fulgham. Well, I mean, this lot can't stand him. And look at that third charge. Just because the girl forced her way into Carrington's room. There's nothing in that, by the way. Not on Carrington's side. Everyone says not. Have you been gossiping about this case in the mess? Me? Good Lord, no. I'm a blooming oyster. You know I am. But I don't stop them talking to me. I mean, one can't be too standoffish. <laughs> they say the Graham girl's just crazy about Carrington, and he never looks at anyone but his wife. Seems rather a waste of material, doesn't it? Did this come from the blonde you sat next to at lunch? Yes, this regiment can pick them. I stood a glass of port after lunch, and do you know what she told me? No. That Carrington and Colonel Henniker had the best of six rounds in Carrington's room that night. What? You mean they actually came to blows? Well, that's what she says, and Henniker had a beautiful black eye next morning. Oh. Nothing about it in his evidence, in the summary... No, yeah. my learned leader, this is all inside stuff. Oh. Carrington was in bed, and Henniker hit him. So out he hopped and gave Henniker a hiding. Henniker's not saying anything because he started it, and Carrington's pretty sure to let it go because he doesn't want more talk than he can help about that third charge. Anyway, that's my blonde job's version, and she's sticking to it. Come in. Oh, Colonel Henniker, sir. Come in, sir. Uh, all right, Fulgham, that's all. Very good, sir. Well, Lancel, can you say yet when you want me? Yes, sir. You'll be the last of my witnesses. 4.30, please. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, 4.20 might be safer. Our president doesn't like being kept waiting. All right, 4.20. All going smoothly? Yes, I think so. Oh, um, one point came up in court this morning. What was that? A witness gave evidence that Carrington told you beforehand that he meant to take this money out of the battery safe. Told me? You don't remember that? No. It's a point of great importance. Why? He still took the money? Oh, certainly. 
But if he gave you prior warning, it alters the whole character of the offence. Really? If uh, a bank clerk helps himself out of the till and says, Oh, but I told the manager... Ah, if the bank owed him money. Do you mean he'd get away with it? No, I don't say that, but obviously, still thinking of your bank clerk. It's one thing if he takes the money surreptitiously, but quite another if he takes it openly after a dispute with the manager over the bank's debt to him. Even though the manager wasn't responsible for the debt? Oh, that would be immaterial. Which witness said this? Oh, shouldn't I ask that? Captain Graham. Oh, I see. Did she hear Carrington tell me? No, she had it from him. Wasn't that hearsay? No, it was said by the accused. <laughs> oh, well, I suppose it's a line of defence. Oh, come. Would Carrington invent a defence like that and invite a witness to support it? Everything hangs on this for Carrington. No, I find that out of character. You know, Colonel, this case worries me. I find the whole offence out of character in an officer with Carrington's background. Background? What background? You're not dazzled by his VC, are you? I wouldn't say so. Well, that's the real trouble. The blaze of adulation that surrounds a VC for the rest of his service. Well, I don't say it's his fault, but Carrington's spoilt. Anything he wants, he feels he has a right to. If he wants leave, he takes it. If he wants to ask a woman up to his quarters, he ignores all orders against it. Background or no background. He was short of money, so he helped himself. As simple as that. He just throws away his career and his pension for £125. Oh, no. No, if he won at Sandown, he meant to slip the money back. If he lost, well, he'd get away with it somehow. Something would turn up. Someone would rally round and help. He's got plenty of friends. <laughs> what he didn't allow for was being knocked out in the next race and taken to hospital. How do you find him as a battery commander? Out of place in the technical unit. He may have been excellent in horse artillery, but in anti-aircraft he's a total loss. Look here. Carrington's whole reputation was made 11 years ago outside Tobruk. In 10 minutes. He took over the layer's seat on a 25-pounder from a wounded Lance Bombardier and knocked out five German tanks. Well, that's more than most of us could do. Very few of us got the chance. I don't underrate what he did, but I didn't want a gun layer here. I didn't even want a war hero. I wanted a battery commander for a highly technical unit. And they gave me Carrington. Still, he's not being tried for inefficiency, is he? No. You're entitled to impute inefficiency as a reason for refusing his leave. That was my reason, of course. And my only one. Well, 420. Yes, please. Um, I shall have to put that question to you in court, sir. Which question? Oh, about whether he confided his intentions in me or not. Yes. If you want the truth, you'd better. Come in. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, come in, Captain Graham. 420, then, Manson. Yes, please, sir. Well, Captain Graham, what can I do for you? I was wondering if I might be allowed to go back to my office this afternoon, sir, to do a little useful work. I'm sorry. No, I was afraid not. The moment I let you go, some new point would come up, and the President would want to recall you. Is it very urgent, your work? Not really, no. To be honest, I just want to get away. I find this harrowing. Yes, I'm sure you do. No one's enjoying it. Don't let them throw him out. You know very well that doesn't rest with me. Not in theory, no. Not in any way. It's for the court to decide when they've heard the evidence. Or as much of the evidence as you let them hear, sir. Captain Graham, if you're going to talk like that, I'll have to ask you to leave my office. Oh, no, please. I'm terribly sorry. I always say the wrong thing when I'm frightened. You can't want to see him chucked out. My duty as prosecutor is to behave impartially and to bring the whole of the transaction before the court. Do you know the whole of the transaction? Not yet. I've only heard one side of it. Not even that. Just the bare bones of one small bit of one side of it. I know he behaved like an idiot, so does he, but he's not like that, really. If you want to know what he's really worth, walk across that barrack square and ask the first man you meet. Captain Graham, you're wasting your talents. It's the court you should attack. I have got one question. Yes? You said this morning that Major Carrington told you he warned Colonel Henniker he was taking this money. Did Major Carrington tell you that? Yes. Are you sure of that? Yes, perfectly sure. What started the trouble between Major Carrington and his colonel? Jealousy. A woman? Nothing so reasonable. What was Colonel Henniker doing during the war? Mm, that's more like it. ACAC command. The whole contest. He never got overseas? No. 
Woolwich, Chatham, and all stations to Dover, never out of touch with the Southern Railway. <laughs> you don't blame him for that, do you? Me? I blame him for everything. Oh, come now. Oh, all right, I know. He's one of our leading technicians. He couldn't be risked overseas. What is it, Fulgham? The president's back from lunch, sir. Oh, Captain Graham, Mrs. Carrington's looking for you. Oh, thank you. Where is she? She's just outside. I'll tell her you're here. Oh, thank you. So I can't do anything with you. I'm afraid not. Well, thank you for rejecting my advances so nicely. <laughs> One thing. What? I'm supposed to set an example in barracks. When you're asking our commanding officer what happened in Major Carrington's room that night, please get him to make it quite clear that the accused and I weren't locked in each other's arms or anything. <laughs> now, that's a reasonable request. All right, I'll do that. Oh, come in, Mrs. Carrington. Val, this is Major Mansell. He's the prosecutor, but that isn't his fault. How do you do? How do you do? And I'm afraid, goodbye. If you want to stay here, Captain Graham, please do. Oh, thank you, sir. Alison, can you drive me to the station? And no, no, I'm afraid I can't. I, I can't leave this place. I thought you'd gone. What's happened? My taxi hasn't come. What train are you catching? 226. If I miss that, I'll have to... Oh. Just the person I'm looking for. Good afternoon, Mrs. Carrington. Who are you? The name's Evans, the Echo. What do you want, Mr. Evans? Oh, just a word about the case with Mrs. Carrington. Nothing to worry, huh? We won't publish anything you don't like. We don't want anything published. Oh, now, Mrs. Carrington, there's a lot of interest being taken in this case, and we want to tell them the truth. You can hear the whole story in court. I never covered a case yet where the court heard half the story. Uh, take your own evidence, for instance. Just when you began to interest me, you stopped. What do you mean by that? I want to find someone who can tell me about the fight in Major Carrington's bedroom. Fight? Was there a fight, Alison? There wasn't a fight, Mr. Evans. Who told you there was? Oh, now, Captain Graham, are you telling me Colonel Henniker bumped his eye on a swing door and Major Carrington barked his knuckles on the, on the windowsill? <laughs> well, they could have, but I don't think so. Nor does the mess waiter, nor does Colonel Henniker's batman. Mrs. Carrington, your text is here, madam. Oh, thank you, Sergeant Crane. Alison, you've never heard of this. No, of course not. I think someone's been pulling your leg, Mr. Evans. Well, could be, of course. I was there. I ought to know. Mrs. Carrington, would you say that your husband Mr. was the sort Evans, of Mr. Evans, I wasn't there. But if there was a fight, nobody told me. Okay. My mistake. Uh, sorry, Mrs. Carrington, I must have got it wrong. Your train, Val, you'll miss it. What? Oh, yes. Goodbye, Alison. Goodbye, Val. Mr. Evans, I think you'd better go. All right, Captain Graham, I'm on my way. Sorry if I asked the right question at the wrong time. So sorry. Now, Colonel Henniker, after you had had this report from the adjutant, did you send for Captain Graham? I did, and she told me that Not on this... what she told you, please. Just what you did. I'm sorry. Well, I decided that I'd wait until the accused was discharged from hospital and then call upon him for an explanation about the missing money. Yes. Well, that brings us to the evening of the day the accused was discharged from hospital. Will you tell the court what happened that night? I dined in the mess, and during the evening I heard, quite by chance, that Major Carrington was back in his quarter. I went up to his room, where I found Captain Graham. And the accused? Yes, the accused was in bed. Suffering from the effects of his accident? I suppose so. When you entered the room, what was Captain Graham doing? She was sitting in a chair. In a chair by the bed? No, a chair by the window. Was there anything in their attitude or demeanour to suggest that they had been behaving improperly? No. What happened next? I pointed out to the accused that in having Captain Graham in his room, he was disobeying my order. Go on, please. He became rather truculent. In the end, I ordered Captain Graham to leave the room and I put Major Carrington under arrest. Thank you, Colonel Henniker. That is all. Fort. Oh, Lord. Uh, Major Carrington, do you wish to cross-examine? Please. Uh, just a moment. Sergeant Crane, sir. It's a dog, sir. I'm glad we agree. Please silence it. Very good, sir. If you would be good enough... Shh. Shh. 
Sergeant Crane is improving. <laughs> now, Major Carrington. Colonel Henniker, I think you'll admit we've never got on very well. Oh, certainly. We have very different views about our army duties, for instance. We certainly have. Let's try to see how and why. Let's start on the 28th of March. The courts heard your version of our interview on that day. We agree that at that interview you told me you proposed to hold a training exercise for my battery staff on the 7th of April. I did. Your battery staff needed training. So badly that it couldn't wait one more day. But hadn't you known for at least six weeks that I was riding at Sandown on the 7th of April? Isn't that rather an odd way of putting it? Had you applied for leave? No. Rather stupidly, perhaps I hadn't. But do you know how many officers out of your regiment went to that race meeting? I've no idea. I'll tell you, 18. Do you know how many applied for leave officially? I'll tell you, not one. My two fellow battery commanders went, Forbes and Holt. Did they ask for leave? I knew they were going. My question was, did they ask for leave? And my answer was, not officially. But I knew they were going. But you didn't know I was, is that what you mean? Yes. Remember a guest night in the middle of February to dine the new CRA? Yes. We sat one on each side of him, didn't we? Yes. And discussed at some length my chances of winning the Gold Cup on Peter Pan. I don't remember. Oh, you should. You joined in. I can call the CRA, you know. I don't remember discussing it. It isn't a subject that would interest me much. I can call four officers who will repeat conversations they had with you in the mess about my chances in the Gold Cup. Do you still say that as late as the 28th of March, you hadn't heard I was riding in the Royal Artillery meeting? I still say it made no impression on me. The moment you told me officially that you meant to ride, I told you that you couldn't, and I told you why. Yes, a training exercise for my battery staff cooked up ten days before the Royal Artillery meeting for the one purpose of stopping me riding. No, for the very legitimate purpose of increasing the efficiency of your battery. I shall ask the court to accept my explanation. Mine doesn't suit your case, I admit. Mine doesn't twist the facts. Uh, gentlemen. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Colonel Henniker, you started that. Your remark was provocative. I'm sorry, sir. Now, Colonel, let's deal with the third charge next about Captain Graham's visit to my quarter. She's told us herself why she came to my room that night. Can you tell the court why you came? Why I came to your room? At 11 p.m. Yes, please. You didn't report your return from hospital that evening. I only heard by chance that you were back. What time did you hear that? At about 8 o'clock in the mess. But you didn't come to my room till 11. Now, why? I didn't mean to come at all that night. What made you change your mind? I had reason to believe that Captain Graham had gone to your room. What made you think that? I, I saw her going upstairs towards the officers' quarters. Well, why not say so? What time was that? About 10 o'clock. About 10 o'clock? And you waited till 11 before you followed her. Now, why? I was hoping that she'd come down again and that I could overlook the matter. You were hoping that you could overlook a breach of discipline by me? Well, we won't spoil that one. Let's go on to the remaining charge, the charge about the money. Here, I admit I behaved very foolishly. I gave you a magnificent opening and you took full advantage of it. Is that remark in order? No. Major Carrington, I don't want to hamper your cross-examination. I'm sorry. Yeah, Colonel Henniker, this charge of fraudulent misapplication. Let's start on the 7th of April last. Did I come to your office then to talk to you about my finances? Yes. Did I tell you I was unable to meet my debts? Yes. Did we discuss the money the government owed me? Yes. A subject we'd often discussed before. We had indeed. And when I asked whether the paymaster had acknowledged my last letter... Did you tell me you hadn't sent it on? Yes. I said I thought it a bad letter. Rude and exaggerated. You hadn't said that to me. I said it then. Did you refuse once more to take any urgent action? I refused to ring up the war office or to send a series of personal telegrams, which was your other suggestion. Did I tell you I was pretty desperate that morning, that things had rather come to a head? You told me at some length about your stepson's school bills and your wife's breakdown in health. I pointed out that you should have known there'd be a delay and managed your finances accordingly. For three years I'd been kicked round the world, never more than six months in any one station, never getting a government quarter, paying through the nose for furnished houses and hotel rooms, never knowing whether Major I could Major Carrington, Major Carrington, I don't want to keep interrupting you, 
But you'll have an opportunity to give your evidence later. Thank you. All right, Colonel Henniker, let's just say we had one more row about the money. But now we come to a vital point. When you were giving evidence just now, the prosecutor asked you, did the accused say anything to you about his intention to help himself to money from public funds? Do you remember that question? Yes. And your answer was, nothing whatever? It was. I thought I might have misheard you. Do you repeat that answer now? Certainly I do. I repeat my very words. I said, if they won't pay me, I'll pay myself out of funds and see what they say to that. You don't remember that? No. Then you won't remember your answer. I naturally don't. I'll remind you. You said, then I shall have great pleasure in seeing you court-martialed. Now, did I make that up? Did I? No. Those were your exact words, weren't they? So far as I can remember, yes. Then how is it you don't remember what I said? You're quoting me in the wrong context. You told me you were going to stand down that day with or without my permission. And I said if you did, I'd have you caught martial. Let's start again. The draft that left the regiment on the 8th of April didn't come only from my battery, did it? No. No, it was made up equally from the three batteries. Exactly. Now, on the morning of the 8th of April, did you send the adjutant to my office to check that there was money in the safe to cover the pay? I did. Can you tell the court why you picked my battery and my battery only? Certainly. Because only the day before you told me you had no money at all. And yet that same evening in the mess I heard you'd been betting heavily at Sandown. I see. Did you hear I'd lost? No. Then you heard I'd won? Yes. And since I'd been betting heavily, I'd presumably won quite a lot. Then can you tell the court why that made you think money might be missing from my battery safe? Yes. That is difficult to answer, isn't it? Can I help you? You weren't afraid the money wasn't there. I told you I was going to take it, and you knew damn well it wasn't there. But you were afraid that unless you did something pretty quickly, I might put it back. Is that a question? No, but this is. Do you still say I didn't tell you I was going to take that money? I do. Then I have only one more question. How do you like knowing that I know you're lying? And you needn't answer that. Thank you, that's all. Do you wish to re-examine Major Mansell? No, thank you, sir. Have you any questions, sir? No, thank you, Mr. Uh, Terry. Any questions by the court? No, no. Thank you, Colonel Henniker. That concludes the case for the prosecution, sir. Yes. Well, I think it might conclude our labours for the day, don't you, Mr. Terry? As you please, sir. Very well, gentlemen. Ten o'clock tomorrow morning, please. But Jim Hennick has hated my guts from the moment I joined. To be honest, you've never wasted much tact on him. No. Oh. And that's why we're here. <laughs> it's time Bell showed up, isn't it? Yes, just about. Mm. There he is now. Mm. Any go? Mm. Strutting across the barrack square on his way to torment the regimental office. <laughs> oh, what luck! He's seen a cigarette end. <laughs> now he's pointing it out to Sergeant Connolly. Now he's made him pick it up. Now he's showing Connolly how to salute. What? In front of the recruit squad he's supposed to be instructing. You know, if he'd ever got to the war, someone would have shot him in the back the first week, and what a lot of trouble that would have saved. All right, you are. Still, I think he's slipped up over this. If I can persuade the court that he's lying, it knocks the bottom out of that charge anyway. It won't be too easy. Oh, I don't know. When Val's given her evidence, I'll get the court to recall him and ask him these two questions. I think that may do it. Copper, mm -hmm. now you are calling Valerie. Why not ask her to tell the court a bit more? Jim, we'll have to go easy with Val. The very thought of giving him sends a half out of her mind. If you knew what work I had on the phone last night to persuade her to come down at all... Well, all I'm suggesting... I is... only want one thing from Val. I want her to help me convince this court that Hennick is lying. Nothing else. I've promised her she won't be asked anything else. Unless the court hears what sort of letter she wrote to you. They're going to think that what you really wanted was money to bet with at Sandown. Now, why shouldn't she tell them the truth? I wrote to my husband and told him that unless I got £100 by return, I was going to put my head in the gas oven. Is that hard to say? If she hasn't got the decency to stand up in court and tell Jim. them... Jim! Yes? Shut up. 
You've been trying to say something like that for a long time. Well, now you've said it. Don't say it again. Come in. Excuse me, sir. Gunner Allen brought your Sam Brown. The man's an incurable optimist. Thank you. And big pardon, sir. Son, Major Clark asked me to wish you luck today, sir. Oh. He says the battery's looking forward to seeing you back in command tomorrow. That's nice of them. Thank you, Son Crane. Thank you, sir. <sighs> this won't do the battery much good, whichever way it goes. I might have thought of that, mightn't I? It's a nice bit of leather, isn't it? Belonged to my governor. Where do you think those two have got to? Her train's late, that's all. I, um... I'm sorry about that, Jim, but we uh, needn't fight about it. <laughs> no. But do you realize that if this court decides to believe Henneker, you may find yourself in prison? They're not going to believe him. That letter, Jim, it's, it, it's not the threat to kill herself. I, I wouldn't mind so much saying that, but... Oh, you know how it is. You, you, you lose your temper and write to someone, and you, you don't mean half you say, and the moment it's posted, you're sorry, and then... Well, to have it dragged up and read out in court and see it in all the newspapers, well, I, I just won't do it. I'd hate it as much as Val would. Come in. She wasn't on that train. Why? Are you certain, Alice? Quite. I saw every passenger pass the barrier. What's the next? 10.22. If she's on it. She will be. She's got to be. I told her it was vital. Why not ring London and make sure she started? Shall I? Please, yes. It's Kensington 7011. I'll, I'll settle up with you later. What? With my girls on the switchboard, the government will stand you that one. <laughs> If she isn't here, we'll demand an adjournment, that's mm. all. Copper, yeah? when you rang her up last night, did she sound all right? Yes, she didn't like it, of course, but... Yes, she, she was all right. Why? Well, that reporter... I told you how much she upset her. Mm. Come in. Oh, oh, thank the Lord. What happened? If I... I went to meet you. Well, I couldn't face coming by train. Father drove me down. Copper... I don't think I can do this. Oh, I'm afraid you must. You promised you wouldn't call me only yesterday. I know, but things have changed. We can't let Henneker get away with perjury. All right, come on then. Let's start. If you're going to ask me questions, you'll have to teach me the answers. There's only one question, and I only want the truth. Just tell the court what I said to you on the phone the morning I sent you the hundred pounds. You said you told Colonel Henneker you were going to take the money, and he said he'd put you under arrest if you did. Well, that's all. And now it's up to you. Copper, mm -hmm. did you and Colonel Henniker have a fight? Well, sort of. What about? He came to my room that night and said something I didn't much like about Alison, so I call him a dirty-minded snooper, and he didn't much like that. Alison, who were you trying to keep it from yesterday? The reporter or me? Oh, the reporter, of course. Go on, Copper. Well, he sort of slapped at me, schoolgirl-like, and I lost my temper and knocked him flat. It wasn't much of a fight. It wouldn't have filled the Albert Hall. And you were there, Alison? Yes. <laughs> Some people have all the luck. Wish I'd seen it. Isn't this coming out in court, Copper? No, it doesn't suit either of us to bring it out. Alison, what was it he said about you? Oh, you know the sort of thing he'd say. He thought he'd walked in on an amorous scene. Now, even he couldn't think that. We were sitting at opposite ends of the room. You might have just got there. No. No, oh, he started up about the time Alison and I got stranded on our way back from Manabir. Did I hear about that? Oh, you, you heard all about it, and so did everybody else. It was in February. We got snowbound and, and spent the night in a pub. I wrote to you, Val. Oh, yes, so you did. Well, he said that it was bad enough when we made excuses to stay at hotels together, but when we started the same thing in barracks and, oh, and so on. The court's open, sir. Thank you, Sergeant Crane. Well, um... How queer mm. of you, Copper, not to tell me all this. Not if you'd been here, I would have. I didn't want to make things sound worse than they are. So you told everybody but me? No, no, he told no one but Jim. Everyone else had to guess. Oh, Val, if you're thinking of letting it worry, you don't. Let's concentrate on our real trouble. Time we went in, Copper. Come on. Oh. When do you want me? No? No, no, not just yet. Just wait here till they call you. Oh, we'll both wait. Now, don't worry, Val. Just don't answer my questions and we'll be all right. Once this is over, we'll be all right. Giving evidence is nothing, Val. They know you've been ill. They'll all be telling themselves they mustn't upset you. Only yesterday, in this room, Copper was telling me how much he loved me, how much he'd missed me, begging me to come back to him. Perhaps you don't believe that. Of course I believe it. He does love you. He's missed you terribly. He certainly doesn't love me. Nor you him, I suppose. Yes. 
I love him, but that needn't worry either of you. He'd never have known it if you hadn't left him. So it's all my fault. I didn't say that. But you meant it. Oh, I'm sure everyone would agree with you. I left Copper because I was out on my feet, ill with worry and overwork. I left him because living together we couldn't pay the rent or the grocer's bills. Val, try to be fair to Copper. You not only left him, you didn't write. You wouldn't let him go to see you. Yes, I know you were ill, but remember all that. Don't take it out of him over this. Take it out of him? I mean, don't hold it against him. Don't stay away from him again till he's so lonely and miserable that he doesn't care what happens. Oh. Well, you won't do that, will you? Oh, come. Even Copper can't have things all his own way. Valerie. So, Major Carrington, you told neither Bombardier I in when you returned the key, nor Major Holt when you gave him back the 25 pounds. For someone who wanted to advertise a grievance, weren't you being remarkably reticent, even secretive? I told Colonel Henniker I was going to take the money. The court has heard Colonel Henniker deny that. And I told Captain Graham. She doesn't deny. Ah, yes, Captain Graham. You say you met her when you left Colonel Henniker. Well, what did you tell her? I told her I was going to take 100 pounds out of my battery safe to send to my wife. And I told her in plain soldier's language what Colonel Henniker could do about it. You said nothing about taking an extra 25 pounds and having a flutter at Sandown? Well, I, I've told you I hadn't thought then of doing that. When did you think of it? Not like taking 100 pounds. It, oh, it was an idiotic last-minute impulse, a sort of spit in the paymaster's eye. Which would have allowed you, if your gamble had come off, to put all the money back in the safe? Certainly not. That was never my intention. I'll repeat that. That was never my intention. Well, let's get back to Captain Graham and see what she did next morning after she'd rung up the hospital. Let's. She then rang up your wife in London to tell her you were better. Yes. In consequence of this telephone conversation, she went at once to your office, where she and Bombardier Owen found £125 missing from the safe. Yes. She then went and got £125 of your winnings from Major Holt and hurried back to return it to your safe before it was missed. Major Carrington, does any of that look as if you told her you were taking this money for advertisement? You've heard her say that none of it was done at my request. Please, will you answer my question? Certainly. When I told her I was going to take £100 out of the safe, she didn't believe me. She didn't believe it till she heard from my wife that I'd actually sent her the money. And after that, her one idea was to clear up the mess. She didn't think it would pay to advertise, and how right she was. This advertising, when was it going to start? When were you going to tell anyone you'd taken the money? As soon as the order to pay the draft came through. I meant to ring up the regimental office and tell Colonel Henniker the cupboard was bare. And I was rather looking forward to that moment. And meanwhile, you said nothing to anyone? Except to my wife. Ah, yes, your wife. Thank you, Major Carrington, that is all. Major Carrington, mm -hmm. your difference of opinion with the paymaster about the money owing to you had lasted many months. More than a year. And ever since you were posted to this regiment, 11 months ago, you have been pressing your commanding officers to support your case for immediate payment. Yes, without much effect. And you claim you told him on the, uh, uh, the 7th of April that since the money had not been paid, you were going to help yourself out of public funds. Wasn't that rather a sudden ultimatum? Yes, sir, but the letter I got from my wife that morning asked me for £100 by return of post. You say she wanted that money to pay your stepson's school bills. That is so. Was the school demanding payment by return? Not exactly, but the fees were overdue. They should have been paid three months before. By what date did the school demand payment? They didn't fix the date. I see. Thank you. Do you wish to ask any questions, sir? No, thank you, Mr. Terry. The court? <laughs> thank you. Uh, call your first witness, please, Major Carrington. I'm only calling one. My wife. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. <coughs> All right? Yes. I won't keep you long. I only want One you to... One moment, please, Major Carrington. We have to establish the identity of the witness. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. 
You are Mrs. Valerie Diana Carrington and my wife, aren't you? I am. There's only one thing I want to clear up with you. On the 7th of April last, did you get a telephone call from me at about 11 o'clock? Yes. Can you tell the court quite shortly what we said to each other? Well, you said you'd just told your bank to send me a hundred pounds. Yes. You said you'd taken it out of your battery safe. Go on. I think I told you you were mad. What did I say? I don't remember. I know I begged you to go and put it back at once. Yes. Yes, then what did I say? Well, did I mention Colonel Henneken? I don't remember. We talked for some time. Yes. And what did I say about Colonel Henniker? Val, this is important. Try to think. Didn't I tell you I had a difference of opinion with Colonel Henniker? No, really, sir. We can't... You mustn't that. leave the witness, Major Carrington. Val, did we talk about Colonel Henniker? No. I don't think we mentioned him. What's this, Val? I don't think so. I can't remember. You can't remember what? I can't remember what you wanted me to say. I simply want you to tell the truth about what I said. Is that difficult? I'm telling the truth. Are you telling the court on oath that you can't remember one word I said about my scene with Colonel Henneker? No, I can't. And how to go in my room, you remembered it. When I rang you up last night, you remembered Yes, last night I knew just what you wanted me to say, but now it's gone. Do you know what you're doing? Yes, and I still can't remember. Well, that's all, sir. I have no more questions. Do you want to cross-examine Major Mansell? No, sir. Mrs. Carrington, your husband has told the court at some length and on oath about this telephone conversation he had with you, and he has called you with apparent confidence to corroborate his account of it. Are you sure he did not tell you on the telephone that he had warned Colonel Henniker he was going to take this money? Yes, quite sure. Any questions, sir? Yes. Mrs. Carrington, do you remember writing a letter which your husband received that same morning? Yes, I remember it. Did it contain an urgent request for money? I asked him for some money to pay the balance of my son's school bills. Urgently? Did you tell your husband you must have it by return? Not by return. No, not by return. Mrs. Carrington, are you sure of Yes, quite sure. May I re-examine, sir? On this point about the letter, certainly. Well, that letter. You admit you asked me for 100 pounds. Yes. Do you deny that you asked me to send it by return? Yes. Do you deny that you threatened violent action if you didn't get it? Violent action? Mm. Threaten to kill yourself. I never said that. I'd like to quote from the actual letter. <gasps> Major Carrington, are you producing that letter? No, but I want to quote from it. If you're going to question the witness on that letter, it must be produced for the inspection of the court. I doubt if my wife would think that fair. Copper! Major Carrington... Is that all? Yes. Yeah. That's all. Any questions by the court? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Carrington. Major Carrington, are you ready to make your final address to the court? Yes. I'm ready. Look, someone's lying. We all agreed on that. Why should Henneker lie? Why should Kennington's own wife lie? Because, Colonel Huxford, she's a nervy, hysterical type just recovering from a mental breakdown. No, Brooksmith, no. Sir? The defence called her, and you heard what Mr. Terry said on that point in his summing up. But I can't remember what you wanted me to say. Could you have clearer proof than that? Yes, yes, I'd want much more than that. You've been watching him for two days... Does he look the sort who'd cook up a lie and, and coach his wife to repeat it? Couldn't you see how stunned he was when she said it? Well, of course he was. He didn't expect her to go back on him. That's what I thought. And what did you make of that letter? Yes, Panton, that letter. He talks a lot about some letter. We hear of his wife demanding money by return, going to commit suicide if she didn't get it. 
And when she flatly denies it, he pulls the letter out of his pocket, the letter, presumably. He reads this famous letter through carefully to himself, and he tears it up. You didn't think that was query? No. First he thought, well, we can settle that. And then he thought, no. Not if it means reading this out in court. Reeve. Yes, sir? You're making that up. Well, sir, I know Carrington. Well, I still don't see why his wife should lie. I mean, what reason she got? Oh, my dear Panton, she's a woman. They don't need a reason for lying. Are you married, Major Brooksmith? No, sir. I nearly was once. Ah, I see. Anyway, I think there probably was something between Carrington and the Graham girl. That would account for his wife's performance. Look, Carrington says he had good reason for taking the money. Well, who hasn't? Who hasn't been swindled and slapped down right and left ever since he joined the service? I know I have. But I haven't paid myself back out of the safe. <laughs> Not yet. He talks a lot about the cost of living, constant moves and all well, that. You're not going to say that moves all... aren't expensive, Pendle. You know that it's easy to keep two boys at school and a major's pay? No, but his two kids cost £140 a term. My children go to a council school. Panton, yeah. you and Huxford still miss the point completely. Oh? I firmly believe that Carrington did warn Henniker he was going to take that money. And Colonel Henniker swears he didn't. And you believe him? Yes, why should he lie? You know Henniker, a disappointed soldier. You must have heard him often enough on the technical versus the regimental officer. Anyone who went fighting in the late contest starts 040 with Henniker. And Carrington's VC would make him see red. You seriously think Henneke would go so far as to perjure himself? <laughs> no need to call it perjury. Why, this time, his version's the only one he believes. Well, Colonel, I don't mind calling it perjury. Look, we found Carrington guilty of absence without leave and improperly entertaining the girl, or you all found him guilty. I didn't, but I still say no sane and balanced CO would have put up a man like Carrington for court-martial on those charges. And that's why I don't believe one word he says about this charge. In other words, Brooksmith, you're saying, well, I don't care what he did, I don't like his commanding officer, he was beastly over some racing, so I'll vote not guilty. Oh. Put it that way, if it amuses you. Now, look here. Uh, gentlemen, I... gentlemen, the more you talk, the more you wonder. Sorry, sir. I think we're ready to vote. The prosecution claims that Carrington took the money secretly and dishonestly. If you believe that, then he is guilty of fraudulent misapplication. Carrington says he took it openly as a gesture. If you believe that, he is not guilty. It's as simple as that. But now, gentlemen, at least one of you is arguing that Carrington could have established his innocence and didn't. If he'd chosen to produce that letter, you say, he could have proved that his wife was lying. Well, that is what I believe, sir. Yes, Reeve, but he didn't produce it. I'm sure that any court of law which decides that the accused could have proved his case but didn't and yet acquits him is on very dangerous ground. We've sworn to try Carrington without partiality, favour or affection. Let's be sure we do it. And now, remembering that in a court-martial a majority verdict is sufficient, I'll take your votes. Guilty or not guilty of the charge of fraudulent misapplication. Major Brooksmith. Not guilty, sir. Major Panton. Guilty, sir. Colonel Huxford. Guilty, sir. Colonel Reeve. Not guilty, sir. Then the verdict depends on my vote. I don't want any visitors, Jim. Now, may you're... we come in? You seem to be in. I don't suppose you're feeling too good, Major. You're right, Mr... Evans from the Echo. And Cook from the Mercury. We only want a word or two, nothing painful. First, are you going to appeal? No. Oh, just like that, eh? Hmm. Ah, what do you think of this sentence? Fair enough. After that verdict, they could have sent me to prison. Oh. Well, it uh, always sounds better that way. Carrington VC goes out with a smile. My God. Look here, clear out. Any plans for the future, Major? No. But I've only been dismissed the service five minutes. Any chance of a word with Mrs. Carrington? She's gone back to London. Oh. I'd be very grateful if you left her alone. And you say a breakdown was caused by your financial troubles. Anything you'd like to give us from a publication about that? Not a damn thing. Now, look, Major. It's the personal angle our readers want. Couldn't we have something about you and your colonel? What sort of show he runs and why you didn't get on with him. We'll see you don't stick your neck out too far. Thanks, but the idea doesn't appeal to me. Well, what about half a dozen signed articles? 
You don't have to write them. I write them. You sign them. You'll find you do quite well out of it. How's that now, Major? I think it's very unlikely I'd ever want to sign anything you wrote. Okay, Major, that suits me. But there's two sides Cut to every... it out. There's Jeffy. two sides to every story, and we can pick which we like. Carrington V.C. dodges prison. How do you like that one? Mr. Evans, there are two sides to you. A front side and a back side, and one of them's in danger. Okay, Major. But don't blame me if you don't enjoy the echo tomorrow. I'm sorry about that, Major. That's all right. My fault entirely. Perhaps I'm not in the mood to be interviewed. Uh, may I say one thing? Must you? The Echo is not the only paper, you know. At the moment, as he said, your news, anything over your name would sell. Articles, even a book, maybe, if you're getting quick. Can I make this clear? The last thing I want to do is to write anything for anyone about this case. You don't have to mention the case. You know, there's a good bit of sympathy with the army officer these days, and, and the facts about pay and allowances over your name. Leave my name out of it. A man at office has got a case, all right. Ask any one of them. But don't quote me. The facts about that, over your name, any editor has print them, and, and the public will read them. Seems to me that can't hurt anyone, and might do your brother officers a bit of good. No. From now on, I'm just another damned fool who tried to get away with the funds. That's all. I hope you've had your money's worth. No. I'm sorry it went the way it did. Goodbye, Major, and good luck. Ah, I made a blasted mess of that, Jim. I might have got them on my side. Government sits on what it owes, wrecks war hero's career. <laughs> Would anyone believe it or care tuppence if they did? Well, what happens now? Do they parade the regiment and drum you out of barracks, or is it all quite informal? Do you just sneak out whenever it is looking? You don't do anything until the sentence is confirmed. Don't you? I have a damn good mind to clear out now, and I don't see who's going to stop me. You? I might, if I had to. Copper, I'd fight it. I'd appeal. It's a waste of time. On what they heard, they couldn't have brought in any other verdict. On what they heard. Oh. I've got a message for Copper. Colonel Reeve wants to know if he can see you for a minute. No, thank you. I'll see him. Jim's disappointed in me, Alison. He thought I could take it. And can't you? No. I don't think I can. Copper. I still can't believe it. But, Copper, were you crazy? Why didn't you show them a letter? All through this business, tearing up that letter is the one thing I've done that I'm quite sure I won't regret. What happens now? Nothing. She says she's through. Copper. You've seen her? No. She left a note. Oh. And that's all she said. Nothing else. What are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to stop thinking. I can't live without her and tell myself I can. After this morning, only a fool would cherish ideas about starting again. There was a moment in court when the bottom dropped right out of everything. I'll take good care to remember it. I don't think you ever get done to telling yourself you can live without someone and till you're half out of love already. Lovers aren't all that sensible. Copper, I know you don't love me, but until you get on your feet again, there may be times when you feel lonely or up against it. There will be. Yes, well, remember me. If you want me any time or... Anything, just whistle. I'll come. Alice. No, don't answer now. I must go. Papa, hmm? Bombardier Owen wants a word with you. No, Jim, I can't. Beg pardon, sir. Oh, I know you don't want me just now, sir, but... Some of the batteries asked me to have a word with you, sir. All right, Eddie. Well, I'd like you to know, sir, there's not one last joined recruit that don't know better than that court-martial. As a matter of fact, there's a movement on foot to show the Colonel what they think of him for starting it. Well, for God's sake, stop that. Yes, sir, I know. The Sergeant Major's trod on that. But there's nothing to stop me saying what I think. And of all the dumb, idiotic mess-ups I've ever seen in 12 years' army service, and that's plenty, that verdict and that sentence just about tops a lot. Well, that's what they think, sir, that's what they'd like you to know. 
Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, Bombardier Owen. Gunner Owen, sir. What? Well, I met the adjutant on the way over, and we had a word or two on the lines I just told you, sir. Oh. I'm under open arrest again. But don't worry, sir. I've had my money's worth this time. Poor old Owen. <laughs> well, Copper, that's what Owen thinks, and it's what I think. And it's what everyone who's ever served with you is going to think. You'd better have my belt, Jim. It's a better one than yours. Thanks. I'll try to live up to it. Good luck, sir. That was Carrington V.C., adapted for radio by Peggy Wells from the play by Dorothy and Campbell Christie. This was the cast. Major Carrington, Howard Marion Crawford. Valerie Carrington, Joan Hart. Captain Alison Graham, Mary Wimbush. Major Forbes, David Enders. The judge advocate, John Garside. The prosecutor, Mark Dignam. Bombardier Owen, Trevor Martin. The president, Lockwood West. Lieutenant Colonel Henniker, Alan Cuthbertson. Major Brooke Smith, Michael Bates. Lieutenant Colonel Reeve, Hugh Moxie. Lieutenant Colonel Huxford, Eric Anderson. Major Panton, Hamilton Dice. Sergeant Crane, John Graham. Captain Fulgham, Charles Hodgson. Evans, Hayden Jones. Cook, Ronald Sidney. Carrington, V.C., which was recorded, was produced by Peter Watts. The news summary will follow in three and a half minutes at five minutes past eleven. <laughs>